ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ به تعالى من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم ارسله الله بشيرا ونذيرا بين يدي الساعه ما يطيع الله ورسوله فقد رشد وما يعصي الله ورسوله فانه لا يضر الا نفسه ولا يضر الله شيئا اما بعد ما شاء المسلمين اوصيكم ونفسي اولا بتقوى الله عز وجل ان الله تعالى يقول بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم وما يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدى هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله now in this khutbah i want to address three related issues cleanliness hygiene and beautification first cleanliness we know that our religion lays a lot of emphasis on purification and cleanliness we can speak of internal purification and of course this is the most important aspect of purification purifying the mind cleaning the soul removing the rust from the heart but the other aspect of purification which i want to speak about is the purification of the outward aspects of oneself of one's body of one's limbs of course the two are related because by purifying one's body as an act of religiosity one already has the idea of purifying oneself and that affects the mind there is a mind body connection and when we wash the limbs of our bodies to prepare for prayer we are in fact purifying our minds to be ready to speak to allah azza wa jalla the whole process through which we make this wudu gets us mentally prepared to worship allah azza wa jalla but purification has been stressed so much that our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is reported to have said at tuhur shatrul iman tuhur or purification <coughs> is a part of faith in the quran allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the wudu and the details of how the wudu might be performed it is mentioned in surah an-nisa and again in surah al-maida in surah al-maida in the 6th verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu o you who believe idha qumtum ila as-salah when you stand up for prayer or when you get ready for prayer faghsilu wujuhakum wa aydiyakum ila al-marafiq wash your faces and your hands up to the elbows wa msahu bi ru'usikum wa arjulakum ila al-ka'bayn and wipe your heads and wash your feet up until the ankles wa in kuntum junuban fatahharu and if you are impure such as the major causes of impurity or from the major causes of impurity then have a bath fatahharu clean yourselves properly wa in kuntum marda aw ala safar 
أو جاء أحد منكم من الغائط ولم يجدوا ماء and if one of you is sick or on a journey or he has had intercourse with his wife but he cannot find water then there is a concession what to do فَتَيَمَّمُوا سَعِيدًا طَيِّبًا then touch clean earth and then wipe your faces and your hands with it. Allah does not desire to place on you any difficulty. Walakin yuridu liyatahirakum. But on the contrary, what he intends is that he should purify you and that he should complete his favors upon you in order that you may be thankful. Now if you think about this ayah, we see that it is worded in such a way that it is short, it is concise, and it includes the major components of the wudu. If one were to read a book of fiqh on how to perform wudu, one may find as many as 13 steps mentioned. But the Quran here mentions the core items. And often when the fuqaha look at an issue, they start with what is mentioned in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because what is mentioned there trumps everything else. And that obviously is the most important thing. The evidence that comes from the Quran is absolute in its authority and clear in its proof. So that proves what is the essential component of the wudu. Washing the face, washing the hands up until the elbows, wiping the head and washing the feet. Now the ayah may be read in two ways. وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ as I've read it would imply that you wash the feet. وَأَرْجُلِكُمْ which is also possible as a reading would mean that you wipe the feet following from wiping the face or wiping the, the head. So there too we see a sort of concession. The usual case is that a person washes his feet but there is a concession that if one had wudu at the time of putting on special socks, then one would be allowed to wipe over the socks the next time it comes to making wudu. For the resident, one day. And for the traveler, up to three days. Some describe the socks as khufayn, as leather socks. And this is mentioned in several ahadith from the Prophet wasallam. Some of the ahadith also mention jawrab, which is not necessarily leather socks, but it could be cotton socks. Some of the fuqaha say that it must be thick enough so that water does not penetrate it. The, obviously, the point is that you must be wearing something which prevents any impurity from touching your skin. In that case, instead of removing and washing, you wipe over the foot gear. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given a concession there. And then a further concession is given in the case of someone who is sick. Perhaps he cannot use water. That will make him more sick. So he has a concession. Or he's a journey. So he cannot find water easily, well enough, comfortably enough for him to be able to take a shower. How is he going to purify himself? So there is a concession, touching clean earth and then wiping symbolically on the face and the hands. This puts you again in the same spirit of cleanliness. It means you have done something physical to affect your mind and to make your mind pure and ready for prayer. So you see the purification is something that is very important, so important that it is mentioned more than once in the Quran. So what is Allah's intention here? with all of these rules about washing and wiping and touching the earth. Allah makes it very clear. 
He does not intend to place on you any hardship. But he intends to purify you. So that shows us something about our religion. It has some purpose behind it. All of the prescriptions of Islam are purposeful. We're not dealing with a dictator, with a creator who, for his own wishes, just simply gives rules without any purpose. But Allah tells us the rules he's giving us is for our own benefit. He wants to purify us. He wants to complete his favors upon us. And in the end, he is hoping that we will be thankful for all of this. So now the, the point is that purification is an important part of our religion. We know that for wudu, there is a reward. Our Prophet ﷺ is reported to have mentioned that the wudu wipes away the sins, washes away the sins. And it raises the servant in degrees. The wudu also, as is mentioned, causes the limbs to shine. And this will be so on the Day of Judgment. In fact, it is mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ will recognize his followers by the shiny parts of their bodies shining from the wudu. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who will be so recognized on that important day. So the wudu washes away the, the sins from the limbs. We wash our eyes. We wash away the sins from the eyes. Wash our mouths. Wash away the sins from the tongue. Wash our hands. Wash away the sins from the things we have touched. Wash away the sins from the places we have walked towards that are not pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what our wudu implies. But cleanliness does not end with ghuzl and, and wudu. Cleanliness continues as a general part of our lives in, a, in, in every way possible. Related to this is hygiene. Taking care of the purification that will lead to better health. One aspect of this is brushing the teeth. Our Prophet ﷺ is known to have recommended the miswak so much that some people thought that it was going to be fard, it's going to be obligatory. He recommended the miswak before every prayer. Obviously, we are going to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should talk to him with a nice breath. Not that it affects him in terms of like the way human beings are affected by, by smell, but we should have that attitude. When you know you're going for a special interview, you're going for an important job interview, how are you going to dress? You're dressing because you know you're going to something important. You're going to talk to somebody special, someone important. If you're going to talk to the king of kings, prepare yourselves. This is why it is recommended that we make wudu before sitting down to read the Quran as an act of devotion and ibadah. Because we're going to recite the words, the Kalam al-Rahman, we purify ourselves. When coming to the masjid, it is even more important that we pay attention to this purification. A brother gets up in the morning, he wants to come to the Fajr prayer. Very good. I wish we could all do that. And we should take an example from the brothers who leave their beds they're, they're described in the Quran. They peel themselves off from the beds and they stand up to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then the brother should make sure he uses his miswak in the morning before coming to join the prayer so as not to offend his brother who prays beside him. In fact, it is mentioned that uh, even if one eats something with a strong smell like garlic or onions, then he shouldn't come to the masjid. Or rather, we should put it the other way around. If you know you're coming to the masjid, don't eat these things with strong smells. Some of us cook with some very delicious spices. And those spices are in fact very delicious. To the extent that those in, in lands where these spices are not used, when first introduced to these, they find it delicious. Curry, for example, has become one of the most uh, popular dishes in the United Kingdom, did you know that? But curry has a strong smell. 
Our ancestors uh, from India and Pakistan and Bangladesh developed the fine art of Indian cuisine. The food is delicious, but it tastes good. It doesn't smell very good outside of the kitchen. So if you happen to walk through the kitchen before coming to the masjid, this is disastrous. Take a journey around the kitchen before coming to the masjid. It is mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ said, what harm would it be if one of you has a special clothing that he wears to the Friday prayer? And one of the wisdom behind this, one of the, one of the benefits of having a special clothing is that it wouldn't come with all of the sweat and so on that, and the smell from, from ordinary work. You come to the Friday prayer, it's going to be a large gathering, you have a special clothing, and you wear that to the Friday prayer. So that it's neat, it's clean, and it smells good. Of course, if you're coming straight from work, it may not be practical, and perhaps not even necessary to change before coming uh, to the Friday prayer, depending on the type of work that you're doing. But think about coming to the Friday prayer in a way that will be comfortable not only for you, but for the brother or sister who has to stand beside you in the prayer. The use of itter, of perfume, is also recommended. In some countries, the use of antiperspirants was in fact uh, not very common. But we come here and you realize that this is so common, it's being advertised everywhere, it's being sold everywhere, and most people are using it. What happens if the Muslim doesn't use it? then the Muslim looks like an, and smells like something odd in the society. Maybe in another part of the world it's acceptable, nobody is using it, everybody is fine. But where everyone else is using it, you have to be up to par as well. It's almost like having a telephone. If everybody else has a telephone and you don't have one, you look odd. And you might say, okay, it doesn't matter, but what big deal does it mean if I don't have a telephone? But if you're not using that antiperspirant, it can become a big deal. People around the office will be gossiping with each other. They won't tell you, not because they're unkind to you, but because they, they don't even know how to tell you. But we say it from the mimbar, so that everyone can be on the same page. It is mentioned that our Prophet ﷺ taught even bathroom manners. And some of the people outside of Islam looked at this funny. They thought, okay, you're getting guidance from a prophet and he's telling you all of these details. But the Muslims saw it as some aspect to be proud of. Because if you think of the Bedouins in the time when the Quran was being revealed, they were mostly uncouth, uncultured, untaught. But Islam came now to teach them from scratch. This is how you clean yourself. Even to the extent that the Prophet ﷺ sometimes had to explain in public how a woman might clean herself. The Quran itself mentions some aspects of that. <laughs> then, when they have purified themselves, then approach your wives in the place where God has commanded you. So the details are mentioned in the Quran. Those who are interested may read Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 222. So details about how even a woman might clean herself. To the extent that we read in the hadith that a woman came and asked the Prophet, how should I clean myself? And the Prophet said, take a, a cloth with some perfume and clean with it. So she said, but Messenger of Allah, how? And the Prophet you know, gave a response which shows that he's not interested in responding uh, to this question. Because how much detail can you mention? And so Aisha radiallahu anha saw the consternation of the Prophet wasallam. She called the woman aside and then she explained to her woman to woman how she might clean herself. So cleanliness and comportment are very important. When I spoke about the miswak, one might get the impression that we mean a specific type of brush that comes from a tree. Now that in the classical literature is what a miswak refers to. 
But the purpose is to clean the teeth. In fact, the purpose is wider than this. In the English translation of a sabiq, as a fiqh sunnah, the word or the term oral hygiene is used. And that means not only brushing the teeth, using whatever instruments are, are best suited for the purpose and the pastes and so on, the uh, fluoride treatment and, and anti-cavity and antibacterial uh, treatments that's, that are available, but also regular checkups, visiting your dentist, having regular cleaning so that whatever plaque and tartar has built up of no fault of your own, it's with, well, beyond your control, these can be removed periodically because these are the source of bad smell. And because they are the sources of bad smell, it will be an act that is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we were to remove those so that when we come and pray beside our brother and sister, we are in fact praying in a way that is good for us and also comfortable for them. Beautification is a third aspect that I want to address in this khutbah. The three are related in that cleanliness, Hygiene and beautification together make the person presentable. These can all be put under one category of, and we can say, comportment. How do you carry yourself? How do you appear? Many Muslims pay little attention to beautification. They think that it makes no difference. You just have certain aspects which are mentioned clearly in the Sharia. Your pants must be this long, your beard must be this long, and they think so long as we pay attention to this, we're done. But beautification is also important. Allah mentions in the Quran, in Surah uh, Al-A'raf, Ya Bani Adam, khudhu zinatakum in the kulli masjid. Take your beautification to every masjid. So you come to the masjid, look good. It's not just you have a topi on your head and the pants are below, above your ankle, you feel I'm done. But wear something that looks good. So that when you pass on the road and people look at you, they should say, there goes a Muslim. Look how this Muslim looks good. When we come to the Eid prayer, we are advised by our Prophet ﷺ to come by one route and to go by the other route. One of the benefits of this is that the others will see the Muslims and it will appear that the Muslims are in a larger number than they ever expected. Because they see just, it appears to them like more people. They see some people going, they saw some other people coming, and it looks like a lot of people. But what do we want to impress them with? Just a large number? Or do we want them to look at the Muslim and say, yeah, these Muslims, look, look how nice they look. So that's what Muslims are like. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even mentions that He created the cattle for us, the an'am, and in that there is beauty as well. Wal an'ama khalaqaha. This is in Surah An Nahl, the sixth verse. Read it for yourself. Lakum fiha dif'un wa manafi'ah. In the cattle, is warmth for you, meaning that you will take eventually their skin and use that for clothing, so you'll get warm. And many uses. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not stop there by mentioning these practical uses. He also continued to say that you enjoy their beauty. Jamal. The beauty of these animals, hina turihuna wa hina tasrahun, when you bring them home at night and when you take them out to pasture in the morning. So you can imagine the farmer taking out his animals and he looks at them and they look so beautiful in his eyes. Who created that beauty? According to this ayah, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created that beauty for us. Allah knows how human beings think. Aesthetics is important to us. So you didn't know if he even just give us the animals which are delicious to eat and whose clothing will make us warm, but he made those animals beautiful to our eyes. So Muslims should appear beautiful, looking good. It is to our detriment that Muslims in Canada and in many parts where Muslims are living now as minorities, 
have paid very little attention to beautification and aesthetics. Yet it is an important aspect of promoting any sort of idea or product or way of life or ideology or philosophy that you put it in a package that is immediately recognizable and acceptable to the people you're trying to market to. But our minds are not on dawah. We're not thinking what will make the people buy. What will make the people accept this message? People are studying how to sell you every cereal. They study. They want to know what color to make the cereal box. So if they're going to make a cereal for a certain group of, of a certain segment of the populace, they gather people representing that segment. They decide, we're going to make a cereal that we're going to sell to people who are from, say, 25 years old to 40 years old. So we get people from within that segment of the populace. Sit them down in a room, 20 of them. Pay them $20 an hour. Show them some images. See their responses. What, what, what do they do when they see these images? What color should be on the package? Okay, show them different colors. Look at their reaction. Then we know what color to use, what package to use. People are studying how to market everything. We've got the greatest idea in the world. We got the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to promote to the people. We have an obligation to share this message. But we don't even think, how are we going to promote this message to the rest of the world? A brother who wants to practice the sunnah says, okay, let me find the sunnah dress. So then we find something from Saudi Arabia or Kuwait. And then when somebody looks at us, they look at it and say, oh, that's Arab. What we need to do is not to copy everyone and, and, and ignore our tradition, but we need to develop a Muslim idea, a Muslim presence, a Muslim appearance. Why do you think that the Muslim in Malaysia dresses differently from the Muslim in Saudi Arabia? Why do you think the Muslim in Pakistan dresses differently from the Muslim in Kuwait? In every region, people develop a certain culture. Clothing is a part of the cultural presentation. And what appeals to people in one area doesn't appeal to people in the other area. So that's why the Muslims in Saudi Arabia dressed one way and the Muslims in Pakistan dress a different way. They're both equally Islamic. The clothing is loose, it is flowing, it covers the satr. No questions asked. From the Sharia point of view, equally Islamic. But each suited to its own culture appealing to the people. When the Pakistani sees the Pakistani dress, that looks beautiful. Khubsurat to them, this is marvelous. The Arab sees the Arab dress, it looks beautiful in its own way. They wouldn't appreciate the dress of the other. Now in Canada, how should Muslims carry themselves then? And I have to end here. This kid has, has come to give me a reminder. So to end, we should recognize that when people see us, they have an impression. Just like the packages on the cereal box, the color and everything gives a certain reaction. We should think about the reaction of the people. What reaction do we want? Do we want them to look at us and say, that's Arab? Or do we want them to look at us and say, that's Canadian? Or how about something in between? How about if we develop such a design such a fashion, specific to men and fashion specific to women, such that when the people see us, they will say, oh, that's Canadian, but with a twist. Oh, that's Muslim Canadian. And then they can speak of it with some respect, knowing that it captures the best of Canadian culture, and at the same time it shows the flair that is immediately characteristic of good, high morals. That's what we need to do. But we don't think. We do not plan. Others plan. And we get caught up in their plans because we don't plan. So in short, very quickly, three aspects. Cleanliness, hygiene, and beautification. 
We should think of these three in consort, in concert, because the three together can characterize a person. We speak of comportment. How do you carry yourself? Carry yourself in a dignified way. A group came to meet the Prophet ﷺ, and after their long travel and being dusty and sweaty and all of that, they all rushed to meet the Prophet ﷺ, except one man. He went away, he took a shower, he put on clean clothing, and then he came to meet the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ praised that man, because he had some dignity about him. And that is how the Muslim should carry himself and herself. I want to stop for a moment. I want to be here and 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 I want to be here وصلى الله تعالى على جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين والملائكة المقربين وخلفاء الراشدين أبي بكر ومر وعثمان وعلي ومن تبعهم بإحسان لا يوم الدين. My dear brother Abu Bakr, who is always here praying, has asked me to make du'a for his aunt who has passed away. May Allah subhanahu wa taala have mercy on her, forgive her, and place her in one of the highest stages of Jannah. اللهم خير المؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم الأموات إنك سميع قريب مجيب الدعوات. اللهم أعيد الإسلام والمسلمين. اللهم انصر من نصر الدين مح. محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وجعلنا منهم اللهم اخذل من خذل دين محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ولا تجعلنا معهم ربنا لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا ميتا إلا رحمته ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة إلا قضيتها يا أرحم الراحمين رحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين Allahu Akbar.